Hi, this is Ray Monsolder. <laughs> Monster by Frank Peretti. And Beck has been captured by the monster and is feeding her berries. And I hope that he doesn't want to bury her. Her husband is on a search party, searching frantically for her. But now we're in the monster's den. I, by the way, thought that the dragon was the monster. But I called Fox News and Hannity told me, no, the dragon is completely gone. He said it was dragon while well, it left, but it went. So now we're back with a different monster. <laughs> that I don't like at all. Let's see what happens. Chapter 4 Unthinking, her mind paralyzed by fear, Beck responded as she was taught to respond to hornets, bees, rattlesnakes, and assorted monsters of childhood. She froze except for the trembling in her hands, which she couldn't help. The thing shoved more berries into her mouth, with fingers the size of sausages. Beck forgot her mouth was already open, and now suddenly it was full again. She closed her mouth in unconscious reflex, and the berries remained inside an unchewed mess. The beastly eyes locked on her, waiting. The face stern under a heavy furrowed brow. The thing grunted again, then tapped on Beck's mouth with thick berry stained fingers. Somehow it occurred to Beck to chew. The berries burst in her mouth, filling it with juice, half sweet, half tart. The wizened face waited and watched. Huge volumes of air rushing in and out through the broad, flat nose. Still chewing, and just now remembering to breathe herself, Beck let her eyes drop enough to see another huge hand with dirty black fingernails curled around her, pressing her against a mountain of dark reddish-brown hair. The hair was coarse, and it was oily, the body beneath it warm and moist, with a familiar and unpleasant sweat smell. She could feel the ribcage expanding, pressing against her, then easing away as the mountain breathed. She had never been this close to anything with lungs this big. Oh, please don't kill me. Could she run? Where? As near as she could tell, she was in the woods somewhere, beyond the tangle of the huckleberry bushes. She could see the thick forest and through its canopy a blue sky. A powerful, hairy arm reached up and grabbed another cluster of berries from a branch. When the hand that was bigger than her whole head descended to deliver the berries, Beck didn't argue. She opened up, let the berries tumble in, and started chewing. With the taste of the berries and her ability to chew them came a conscious realization that she was still alive. 
quite notable given the circumstances. How long she would remain that way, she had no idea and no encouraging thoughts. She turned her head just enough to study her situation. She was being held by what appeared to be a huge ape, similar to a gorilla, but not quite a gorilla. The crown of its head extended to a narrow crest, like a gorilla's, and it had a prominent brow ridge over the eyes. But the jaws didn't protrude as much, and the lips were more flexible and expressive. As near as Beck could tell, the creature's legs were folded beneath it. But one large hairy foot jetted out with a wrinkled hairless sole and all five toes aligned in a row. By his ample fur-covered bosom, Beck included, it was a female. They were now sitting in a cavity created when a tree upended, pulling the root ball out of the ground. Thick bushes, most of them huckleberries, had since moved in and now provided a blind that hid them from the outside world. The female held Beck inescapably in her lap with her left arm while feeding Beck with her right. Now the load of berries was on the way. Beck couldn't take much more of this, but unless she wanted more berries smeared all over her face, she opened up and let the beast dump them in. She chewed but didn't move, didn't stir, didn't make a sound. Her hands were still trembling. Suddenly the big arm loosened and the creature let her go. She slid down that big hairy body to the ground. Run, her instinct screamed at her. Didn't matter which direction, run for the trees. All it took was this lightest weight on her right ankle. Ow! With a shriek of agony, she fell in the tangled limbs and stalks, grabbing her ankle, grimacing. She checked for a break for, oh! The pain flashed up her entire leg, red hot and lingering. She settled backward on a bush, bending and crumpling branches, gasping. She thought of crawling pulling herself out of the woods with two hands and one good leg. Not good enough. The beast lunged forward faster than Beck could pull to get away. It overshadowed Beck like a rust-red thundercloud, nudging her, poking her with a big finger, nearly flipping her body over. Terror in combination with her stutter, took away Beck's ability to speak, even to scream. The creature backed off, resting on all fours, and gave her some space. Daring to move, Beck felt her ankle again in the creature's sentry-like stare. The ankle wasn't broken, as near as she could tell, but she did have a cruel souvenir from her tumble over the falls, a bad sprain. She wouldn't be walking, much less running, anytime soon. Beck lifted her eyes to the creature. Was it possible to make peace with this beast? A cluster of berries was within reach. This beast seemed to want Beck to eat them. Well, if it would make it happy. Daringly, her hands still quaking, Beck reached halfway to the berries, hoping such personal initiative wouldn't seem threatening. 
there was no violent reaction. The thing didn't growl or bite. Slowly, inch by trembling inch, she reached the rest of the way and grabbed them. The ape thing let her making strange guttural rumblings and a clicking sound like wood hitting bamboo. Duck, duck, duck. Beck placed the berries in her mouth and reached for more, eating them slowly. The beast expression softened. She eased back onto her haunches and watched. From this slight distance, Beck got a first full look at her. She was very much like a gorilla, but with a body like a barrel and a neck so broad it blended with her shoulders. Her legs, thick as tree trunks and covered with hair, were longer than one would expect in an ape, but the arms were definitely ape arms, long enough to reach Beck's neck and wiring the life out of her. As Beck lay still, chewing berries, the pain in her ankle subsided enough for her to notice a dull ache in her head. She touched the side of her forehead, felt a bump, ouch! Another spot that hurt, then found dark flaking blood on her fingers. Oh, dear Lord, what, what, what happened? She remembered falling, but after that, nothing. If she was this beat up, what on earth had happened to Reed? Was he lying somewhere in worse shape than she was? Her backpack was missing. Maybe this monster tried to raid their backpacks for food. And Reed had tried to resist, tried to save Beck and gotten the brunt of the mon monster's rage. She didn't think about it anymore. She dared not. But then came more bad news. A further inventory revealed a large smear of blood on her leather jacket where she'd been pressed against the creature's side. She looked and found a corresponding dark stain on the big ape's shoulder and left flank. If her fear had ebbed even slightly, now it returned. She met the creature's eyes and thought, what have you done? The monster stiffened, suddenly alert and alarmed. The lips pulled back slightly, revealing the edges of the teeth, sharp white incisors between an imposing set of canines. Beck cowered. Oh no, I've made it angry. But the big female wasn't angry. Wasn't even looking at her. It was listening. The look on its face, the piercing stare of its eyes, its motionless body reminded Beck of their dog Jonah and how he had reacted whenever he heard a distant coyote or the UPS truck approaching a half mile away. And there was that foul smell again, a new sickening wave of it. It happened so fast, Beck didn't have time to object or resist. Before she could even scream, the big hands enfolded her and snatched her from the ground, shaking her insides and nearly, nearly giving her whiplash. Limbs, leaves, and berries blurred past her eyes, 
and whipped her head and shoulders. She covered her face. There was a burst of acceleration so fast that the wind swept her hair from her face. She lifted her eyes. She was flying, lunging through the forest at an altitude of six feet. Her body held fast against that abundant bosom by two muscular arms. Tree limbs blurred by like, by like fence posts. Tree limbs blurred, I'm sorry, tree limbs, limbs burned, blurred by like fence posts on a freeway. She curled her legs up as her hands grabbed fistfuls of hair, red hair, in a death grip. Beneath her, the creature's big feet pounded the ground as she leaped over logs and dodged thickets and brush with incredible agility, slowed by nothing. With a little wine, Caesar, the German shepherd, balked only a few yards into the trees, turned back, looked down the hill at Agnes, his handler tried again, whined again, and finally, in a timid trot, ran to his master and cowered behind her legs. Agnes, whose dogs had served the county sheriff's department, the state patrol, and local police departments for the past 12 years, looked puzzled, to say the least, as she stroked the shy dog's neck. Caesar, what is it? What's the matter, boy? Reed didn't find the dog's behavior one bit surprising. He felt that way himself. He just wasn't going to whine about it. Pete Henderson and his team of searchers looked as mystified as Agnes, gawking up into the woods from a small clearing on the mountainside. Scatter Creek ran through this clearing, cutting across the trail just below them and cascading over a 10-foot waterfall. Agnes had taken Caesar to the base of the waterfall, the spot search teams called the LKP, the last known place Beck had been, and let him go. He'd hesitated, whined, followed a scent up to the trail, spun in circles, followed it across the trail and up the clearing, turned back at the trees, and then with some goading from Agnes, continued into the trees. A few yards in, he'd had enough. Pete's radio squawked. Team one, in position at the campsite. Pete spoke into the handheld. Team two above the waterfall of the LKP. He gazed curiously at the dog. We're um, working the canine right now, good hunting. He clipped the handle, he clipped the hand held to his belt and looked down toward the trail where Reed and the others waited for further orders. Reed tried to keep his impatience in check. He knew all these people were as eager and on edge as he was. The two search and rescue volunteers, one the dental assistant and the other the heavy equipment operator, both tracking apprentices, the two marksmen, one of them a newcomer named Thorne, who looked like a Marine, two medical technicians with emergency kits and a stretcher, Don Nelson and Tyler Jones, experienced trackers, who would form the three-man tracking team with Pete, Agnes Hastings, 
the canine handler, and Cap Capella there because he was a friend. All were dressed for the job and grim with the business at hand. But any hasty move at this point could destroy important signs and evidence. Pete had to make the calls. Pete was obviously troubled over the dog. He asked the handler, has he ever done this before? She was still putting Caesar who refused to budge from her side. No, never. But he's tracked bears before. Nine times in the past two years. Pete gestured toward the trees from which Caesar had fled. Well, he found something. It turned him back, but it's something. He reached for a set of short aluminum poles that hung on the tracker's vest. He began to screw them together into one five-foot length. This was his tracking stick, a rod marked in one-inch increments with movable rubber O-rings for marking on the stick the size of prints and the stride length between them. Don and Tyler, I'll take point. You flank. We'll start where Caesar's afraid to go. Reed and Cap, you follow the flank men. You step where they step and don't disturb anything. Agnes, I know Jimmy's real eager to have Caesar help out at the other location. Want to head up there? The dog handler gave a resigned shrug, put Caesar's leash on him, and led him up the trail toward the cabin. Caesar was more than happy to go. Pete took a moment to focus on Reed. Reed, buddy, you ready? Reed knew he didn't know what he was saying, but he answered, I'm ready. Pete told Camp, you stay close to him. He directed his attention downhill. Joni and Chris stand by. When we find the trail, we'll need you to cross track. And you guys with the guns guard our flanks. Everybody keep quiet. That bear could still be around. Medics stand by on the radios. Pete led the way up the hill. The flank men took positions just behind him one on his left and one on his right, forming a triangle with Pete at the point. Reed fell in behind the man on the left, Cap behind the man on the right. The marksman guns ready, eyes and ears alert, followed wide to the sides. When Pete moved, they all moved as one body. Pete led the train slowly, eyes scanning back and forth as they all moved into the trees, his tracking stick ready in his hand. Only a few steps in, he used this stick to point out bent grass and crushed twigs where an animal or a human had passed through. Had a lot of traffic through here this morning, he said in a quiet, stealthy voice. So the trick is going to be telling the difference between everybody else's sign and the sign we're looking for. Reed and Cap exchanged a look. Yes, they and Singh had spent quite a while thrashing through these trees and thickets leaving their own disturbances everywhere, possibly obliterating everything Pete needed to find now. Reed didn't know whether to feel sheepish at the blunder or just plain aggravated at life's unfairness. Book print on the right, said the right flank man, pointing with those own stick. Pete saw it. 
coming your way, Tyler. The flanker to the left inch forward, carefully checking for more prints. Okay, got it. He pointed out a depression in the pine needles at Pete's 11 o'clock. Pete held his tracking stick between the two tracks, measuring the distance between them, then straightened and asked, Reed, Cap, either one of you come through here? Reed and Cap exchanged a look. Cap wagged his head. Reed answered, I think I did. Let me see the bottom of your left boot. Reed grabbed Cap's shoulder to steady himself and stuck up his foot. Pete studied and measured the boot sole while Tyler pulled out a pencil and a pre-printed diagram of a footprint. Pete dictated, okay, one three-point waffle tread section four thumbnail pattern on the right side center to lower right corner section 10 sliver in lower right corner it's him said don looking at the track on the right Shh. Tyler drew the worm patterns on the diagram and labeled it Reed Shelton. I suppose you were in a big hurry last night. Yeah, I was. Well, it's you, all right. Thanks. They moved farther into the trees <clears throat> as far as the dog had gone. They could see his sign as Pete pointed it out. Paw prints, a bent pine needle, a toe, and a claw mark on a rotting log. A trail left by a very hesitant canine who didn't know which way to turn next. This was the spot. Whatever was troubling Caesar had to have left something here. Pete sank carefully to one knee and remained still, as if listening. His eyes began to sweep across the cluttered forest floor as he studied the twigs and the pine cones, the fallen needles, the scattered pebbles, the blades of grass, tiny broad-leaved weeds, Reed saw his jaw tense. Then Pete pointed with his stick. Tyler, Tyler replied, Yeah, you've got it. Reed peered over Tyler's shoulder, but he couldn't see a thing except the cluttered, busy, infinitely detailed forest floor. Pete removed his hat, went down on his belly, the side of his head to the ground, his open eye next to the ground, and the other wink shut. Yep. He raised up on his side and carefully pressed his thumb into the soil, leaving a small oval indention. Then he went in close, his nose only inches from the tiny leaves and grass. Yeah, maybe half a day old. Could have come through last night easy. Tyler whispered to Reed, pointed carefully with his tracking stick. You see the shine on that leaf right there and the dip in the needles underneath. Reed looked a long time, but finally he saw it. He thought. Rear foot, Don asked. I want to see another one. Pete answered and 
He measured the impression with a tape measure. Got about five, one half inches across. That makes him one for the record books. What a heavy son of a gun. Well done, flagged the impression with a pink ribbon and a popsicle stick. Pete pivoted the tracking stick forward, holding the handle over the impression and swinging the tip in a slow, careful arc. Come on now. Let me see a heel print. Pete, and so the whole group, inched forward. Don pointed with his stick. Got some snap branches at one o'clock. They all looked and saw the spindly most dead branches on the lower trunk of a pine either bent or snapped in an uphill direction. And bingo, said Pete, selecting some tweezers from his pocket and plucking a long reddish hair from the jagged stump of a limb. The hair gave him pause. He handed it back to Don. That looked like a bear to you. Don held the specimen up to the light. Well, maybe kind of long. Pete asked Reed, what color is Beck's hair these days? Reed examined the hair, Don held in the tweezers. Reddish brown. Pete exhaled a half whistle. Whew, lordy. Don carefully placed the hair in a Ziploc bag. Pete stood still, probing ahead with narrowed eyes. Finally, he let out a held breath. Okay, we've got another one. The bodies of the trackers inch forward again. This one was more visible, a roundish impression in some humus. To read it looked as though someone had knelt there and left the knee print. Pete went on his belly, eyeing the print carefully, then measuring it. He straightened up, still on one knee. He was troubled eyeing the area between the two prints. Where are the front feet? We've missed something, Don agreed as he flagged the print. Well, we'll find him, said Pete. He stretched out his tracking stick to measure the distance between the two tracks but it wouldn't reach. He chuckled. Either that, or the bear has one heck of a stride. They moved ahead this time according to the length they'd found between the first two tracks. The third one, nothing more than a scuff on a rutting log was where it should have been. The same distance from the second as the second was from the first. They had a pattern. Singh crouched in the doorway of the sorrowful old cabin and took one last shot of the destruction inside. She was amazed. In her line of work, she'd photographed and reconstructed crime scenes involving hoodlums and vandals, domestic spats, drug-related murders, and meth lab explosions. But they were nothing like this. For one thing, the beast 
that made this mess was far, far outside the human category. Certainly human scum could show this kind of disregard for property, but to snap support posts like toothpicks and tear whole walls open required an esteemable strength that she'd never encountered. For another thing, and this still felt a little odd to her, according to the rules out here, this wasn't even a crime scene, but made perfect sense. Bear gets hungry. Bear finds food. Bear does what's necessary to get it. Tearing the windows out of the building. Smashing cots and shelves. Splintering a door were shocking, destructive acts. To civilized perceptions but to a bear's way of thinking no different from clawing the termites out of an old stump. It was frightening. It was fascinating. And not too hard to understand. If it was a bear. How's it going, Jimmy? Oh, I'm sorry. How's it going? Jimmy, the conservation officer, called from the bridge. He was obviously impatient and she couldn't blame him. Agnes, the dog handler, had arrived with Caesar. And Jimmy and the hunters were ready to move, so the only thing holding them up was Singh's directive from Sheriff Mills. She'd photographed Reed and Beck's campsite, their food stash, the log bridge, and the littered area around the cabin. She'd paced off distances and made notes. Everything that was directly knowable, she'd recorded on several pages. She'd worked expeditiously, but the process took precious time. Jimmy had somehow managed to defer to the sheriff on this one, but she could feel him breathing down her neck with each passing minute. With great relief, she called back, I'm through, and stowed her camera and notebook in her backpack. Jimmy immediately turned his attention to Agnes. All right. Let's get a scent and track that baby. The hunting party was sniffing Caesar in the lead, nearly stampeded off the bridge and down the trail. They jostled past Singh as if she were an obstacle. She hurried up the trail, relieved with every step that put distance between them. The other team members were now covering the surrounding area in widening quadrants. She could hear them calling to each other, maintaining voice contact as their way, as they worked their way among the trees like fleas in a hairbrush. At certain moments, she spotted some of them, but she hadn't caught sight of Sheriff Mills to fill him in on. See, up here. Ah, he was waving to her from the hillside above the trail. She selected a route up the embankment with sufficient footholds and branches to grab and worked her way to him. And at the top, Mills and Deputy Saunders were waiting for her. They were examining the campsite, two sleeping bags on a ground cloth, cloistered in a tight pocket among some trees. It wasn't an instant find, as Reed had warned it. It was hard to see from the trail. Find anything unusual down there besides everything? 
She looked down into the draw where Jimmy and his hunting party lurked near the cabin, waiting for Caesar to show them the way. That bitter was very hungry or very angry at being so hungry or, well, let's just say he was highly motivated, but no sign of Randy. No, sir. Bill's expression was troubled as he scanned the forest in wide arcs, his eyes landing on the searchers below. We need to find a body, saying. The deputy suggested, why don't we get Reed over here so he can show us where he saw it? He won't leave the search for Beck. Mills gazed at the map, Reed had drawn. We've located the campsite in the stash of food containers between the two trees. But this tree right here, the big cedar tree where the body is supposed to be, well, maybe it's the right tree, maybe it isn't. But there's no body. Then Jimmy cursed so loudly it startled them. Agnes started hollering, Caesar, Caesar, come boy, come Caesar. Of course, they had to watch. From up here, the view was quite good. Caesar was trying to run the trail away from the cabin, and Agnes was hot on his heels, leash in hand. The dog stopped at her command shied away again, answered her command again, then fidgeted, obviously wanting nothing but to get out of there. When Agnes finally snapped the leash onto his collar, he tugged at it, jerking in little circles, trembling and dribbling urine. What's his problem? Jimmy demanded, rifle in hand, but with nothing to shoot. I said, what's his problem? I don't know, the handler shouted back. I'm about to retire him. He's just never acted this way. Her legs were getting snarled in the leash. Well, does he track bears or doesn't he? He tracks bears. Black bears, grizzly bears, any kind of bears. Well, he's not doing us much good now, is he? Jimmy turned toward the marksman behind him. What'd you say? The marksman was not the kind to be intimidated. I said, maybe this ain't a bear. Now Jimmy was simmering at a temperature even Singh could feel from the hill. He pointed his finger at the man. Excuse me, Jansen. If you're going to be on the team, you're going to handle yourself in your mouth with professionalism. You got that? Yes, sir, I got that. Now Jimmy addressed all three people in a voice suitable for a hundred. This is a rogue bear that we're after. It's serious business. We're going to keep our minds clear and straight ahead so we can get the job done without anyone getting hurt. Is that understood? Jansen nodded. The other hunter said yes. And Agnes just petted Caesar. Jimmy leaned in on her. Agnes we need a dog that'll track this bear. And if your dog can't do that, we need another dog. Are we clear on that? Clear enough. Agnes steamed a moment, then led Caesar back up the trail toward Abney. Come on, boy, we don't need any more of this. Caesar led her, only too eager to go. Jimmy watched her go, 
then stumped around a bit, then conferred with his hunters, saying something about bait and bear stands. The show was over. Sheriff Mills turned back to Singh and Deputy Saunders. Well, we'll give the searchers a few more minutes. Then we'll have to get Reed and Pete over here. Singh thought it wise to remind them, Sheriff, every other aspect of Reed's account holds up. Sheriff Mills regarded the cabin below. So you don't think one man could do that kind of damage to the cabin? She almost laughed. Not even remotely. And if you remember, Reed's camera recorded pictures of the demolished cabin before it recorded pictures of Beck alive and well. Mills nodded but asked, I don't suppose you've spotted any bear prints anywhere. She felt the strange sensation of thin ice under her feet and maybe reeds. Well, it is loose ground around here. Lots of rocks, lots of humus and pine needles that don't register up print at least to someone who isn't a tracker. We'll see what Pete says. Sure, we'll see what Pete says. But sir, Reed never said anything about a bear. He provided no bear scenario. If there was foul play, if he had planned this, you don't have to sell me. I'm glad to hear it, sir. Mills only responded, but we better pray they find Beck. Pete's team was picking up some speed now that he, they knew what to look for. They'd worked their way up the hill another hundred feet, while two trackers accompanied by the marksman named Thorn started crisscrossing their path a shouting distance ahead of them, hoping to encounter signs farther up. For Reed, it was all too tedious. They could die in the dirt somewhere long before they could ever find her. Cap must have sensed his mood because he kept whispering. Easy now. We're moving okay. We'll find her. Got to do it right. What did this thing do have its claws cut? Then came a shout from one of the trackers far up the hill. We've got something! Pete told Reed and Cap, better stay here. He and his men went ahead. Triumph stretched into eternity, but Reed had no hurry left in him. He could only stand there and take frightened, furtive glances as Pete and his men disappeared into the forest. For a long time, such a long time, Reed heard them pushing through the limbs and brush as they spoke in hushed, clipped phrases and moved in a wide arc. When they finally came into sight again, they were far away, their outlines broken by a jittery web of branches and limbs. They could just barely see them approaching the other team members and whatever the object was. Pete circled the, sub the object, then called up, come on up, Reed. Reed drew a deep breath and wiped his eyes clear. Come on, said Cap, touching his arm. They pressed through the pines and the firs, approximating the path the others had taken. When they finally emerged from the insistent, aggravating, view-blocking fingers of the forest, 
Reed could see the others gathered in a wide circle in front of a huge fallen log. The two marksmen were only standing guard. And in the center of the circle was a blue black backpack. Not set there, but dropped. It was dirty. And the frame was bent. As if it had fallen over a waterfall. Every eye focused on Reed, waiting for the verdict. And that's it. That's the story till now. I'll read you just a little tiny bit of a teaser for next time, okay? Chapter 5. Reed's voice quaver quavered, though he tried to control it. It's hers. She picked out the color. Don't touch it, said Pete, looking around the area at his two flankers, visibly bothered about something. He asked Reed, do you know if there's any food in there? Well, we packed some granola bars. She may have had some of her lunch left over. Pete went down on all fours for a closer look, studying the pack on all sides. If I were a camp raiding kind of bear, I'd be interested in that. This one wasn't. This pack doesn't have a mark on it. And that's where we will end things Till next time. Ah. What'd you think? Well, I'm waiting for more, but I guess I'm going to have to wait. Gonna wait. I didn't know we were still on. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. Today, yeah. Cameras are funny. And what did you think of it? Huh?